Today, we're going to talk about executing a best-in-class benefits portfolio. Your company could have up to five generations of employees all under one figurative roof, with each generation valuing your benefits differently. The result? An expensive, disjointed program with dozens of underutilized services and an experience that leaves employees confused and underwhelmed. To help you improve your benefit strategy and engagement, communication, and employee health outcomes, we've called in Jason Perot, Senior Vice President of Enterprise Growth and Partnerships at Vita Health. Jason has worked at Fortune 10 companies, including AT&T and Boeing, where he evaluated up to 300 benefits RFPs per year, and then selected the top 1% that would be included in their benefits package. These experiences, coupled with a personal experience, propelled Jason into a different realm of HR benefits that is going to help all of us, and we could not be more excited to have him share his expertise and that story with you today. Jason, welcome to Voices of HR. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, Berta. Well, we are so excited for this conversation because, you know, I always say those who choose the HR profession have this insatiable appetite to help others be successful. And you are definitely one of those people that I can use as an example, but in a unique and different way. And here's why. At one point, you were procuring healthcare benefits for these large employers, I mean, AT&T and Boeing, evaluating their organizational fit and timing and prioritization. And I remember at one point you shared with me how all you had all these Excel spreadsheets and you would use data points to prioritize them, which sounded like a fairly manual process. And then you had this personal experience, this story about, um, I think it was a colleague of yours, that really changed the trajectory of your career. Would you first, let's start, would you first share that with us, that story? Absolutely. I'd love to. You know, um, back in like 2017 or so, I had the privilege to uh, observe a 30-minute Shark Tank style pitch from the founder CEO of Vita Health, Stephanie Telanius. And, you know, part of her story was why she launched Vita in the first place. Vita means life. Mm -hmm. And she shared her personal experience trying to help her father who had multiple chronic health conditions along with depression. And it was virtually impossible to help her dad in this complex patient journey in a fragmented state, seeing different practitioners, physicians, specialists that were not integrated. And there had to be a better way And that was really the light bulb aha moment for Stephanie to launch Vita way back in 2014. And that story absolutely resonated with me on a number of fronts, trying to figure out ways to simplify the employee experience around utilizing healthcare and digital solutions that could greatly aid and enhance that user experience in a complex state. Yeah, sometimes, you know, experiences like that, they just set you on a path that helps you be more more impactful than what you've been doing in the past, even though you had an incredibly big job. So you have seen employers, I think what we consider the best of intentions, build, who want to build this benefits portfolio, but some of them have, I think you said, as many as 16, 17, 18 apps that help their employees manage maybe health or mental health and physical fitness because employers really are trying to manage benefits sometimes for five different generations within their workforce, all with different needs, all with different wants, and all with different values. So how does trying to create this portfolio benefits package that benefits everyone impact engagement and utilization of their actual benefits package? Yeah, it's really interesting if we trace back over the last, say, 25 years we saw a heavy reliance from an employer perspective on our health plan carriers and our PBMs and our uh, deeply mature benefit vendor partners to do much of this you know, uh, work for us. And in many ways, we saw a real ocean of opportunity 
for the innovators, the startups to really solve for these complex, you know, healthcare needs in a much deeper, broader way. And really what we witnessed in the past decade plus is just thousands, literally thousands of startups and innovators in their own unique way, trying to solve for various opportunities and problems in the healthcare marketplace as we know it. And with the best of intentions, as you mentioned, Berta, myself included, along with all my counterparts, you know, we were very busy identifying, curating, evaluating, and ultimately awarding and implementing many of these so-called best-in-class solutions that at the time on paper looked wonderful, very promising. And over time, we, we in many ways created this super complex benefit vendor supply chain with literally dozens, in some cases, some folks have 30, 40, 50 solutions all embedded. And it becomes overwhelming and confusing for your typical employee to know where to go for what and how to utilize it and how is it going to benefit them. And even if they do engage and enroll into that, we also find a very real opportunity to focus on vendor integration. And often many times, these myriad of solutions are fragmented and siloed, just like we normally see today in the healthcare system. So how can we you know, harmonize and integrate that together? And I think really this pendulum shifted from you know, the past state 25 years ago to this complex state with all these really meaningful value-add solutions, certainly on a digital therapeutic and, and uh, virtual healthcare front, telehealth for that matter as well. And we're starting to see this pendulum shift back towards simplicity. When we think about the real life of that patient employee experience, how can we take the complex out and make it simple? How can we provide multiple solutions all in one that's fully integrated so we can take care of the chronic, the mental, and the physical preventive lifestyle all in one? And I think that's the beauty that we've seen with Vita and other solutions and employers really starting to rotate back towards really focusing first and fundamentally on that patient experience. How can we make that better tomorrow than where we're at today? And as an industry, we've also observed a suboptimal level of engagement, enrollment, and utilization of these myriad of products and programs that we've launched with the best of intentions. So how can we raise the bar and drive better engagement, long-term sustained utilization, or as long as necessary to achieve those clinical outcomes and financial outcomes for the good of those, those members that we're serving day in, day out on the employer side. So that's really where, you know, we're in this fascinating inflection point to focus on all that, which is a real opportunity for all. Yeah. I mean, employers, they spend mil millions, millions, billions probably of dollars on the employee benefits. I guess the question before someone would sit down and actually start maybe rethinking their benefits package, you know, there's been this severe disruption in our workplace where today employees are valuing work and everything that really encompasses their life very differently than they did three years ago. So I'm curious to your, to get your thoughts on you know, are they valuing benefits the same way? And are they defining benefits the same way? The benefits that they want from their employer as a starting point? Yeah, we, uh, you know, there's been some very recent and interesting studies and surveys and data points that I think absolutely proof positive suggest that is absolutely what the employers and their employees and their families that they're serving as covered dependents want and need. They want better accessibility. They want improved affordability. You know, when we think about mental health, and that's been a top concern of many employers for the last several years, and the pandemic exacerbated that, you know, we, we want to find ways to mitigate the risk of stigma and lack of engagement. Mm -hmm. So utilizing all these, you know, value add solutions really go a long way when we think about how can we best position it. So we're serving the, the wants and needs of our you know, collective workforce that is very diverse in many ways for many employers. So what one cohort of employees may want or need may differ from another. When we think about the demographic segmentation of the workforce, it's, it's very true. We, we also have witnessed um, in recent surveys over a, 
I would say uh, last year alone, we had over 100 million Americans grappling with some level of medical debt. Mm -hmm. We had about 53% of Americans that bypassed, they chose not to get a prescription medication filled because they're grappling with, you know, do we put food on the table? Do we pay rent to have the shelter? Uh, maybe I can't afford that prescription medication. So these are really, you know, significant concerns. We've also seen a life cycle or actually a life expectancy decline in the United States in recent years for a number of reasons. You know, opioid deaths has skyrocketed to over 100,000 for the first time in a year. I mean, there's a lot of troubling trends and, and pain points, but I really view it as an ocean of opportunity as far as how we recalibrate our thinking and reimagine how we can do better as, as a, an ecosystem of innovators, startups, and, and that's really on the supply side, but it's also the buy side, right? Whether it's employers or health plan carriers and you know other medical system providers, how they can enable some of this technology and innovation and bring it to the forefront to improve accessibility to anyone, anywhere, anytime in a multimodality approach, whether it's video, telephonic, asynchronous, text chat, but everybody's different and everybody has a, a preference on how they may or may not want to engage on with their healthcare or for the good of their family. So I think we need to be very flexible and thoughtful about what we bring forward to meet everyone, regardless of what they may prefer, want, or need in a very, you know, well, well, well constructed way that can address all those different opportunities. But there's a world of opportunity, which is exciting, but it's also uh, scary too. Another statistic that we also have seen is north of 42% of Americans are technically obese today. And by 2030, it's projected at 50%. So one in every two Americans will be obese by that point. So we're seeing this upward trend on people with you know, diabetes, pre-diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and, you know, just imagine, you know, when you look at some of these clinical categories such as that, how, how do we not just focus on that alone, but think about the whole person? Because usually there's more to unpack when we think about what's going on in their patient journey and how can we help them in a holistic way to address, you know, all those various needs that they might have, but meeting them where and when they want to be met. I, I think that is critically important to uh, focus on that patient experience and, and deliver everything they want and more. Yeah. I mean, listening to you, I just, it's no wonder there are so many different benefits because the world has become so much more complex. Everything that you just listed there just increase the complexity of the benefits package tenfold because you you need to address all these different needs of your employees if you truly want to deliver a benefits package of value. So is so do you think now, I mean, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you think now is the time for employers really to step back and assess the state of their health and well-being benefits because of the increase in complexity? Yeah, it's it's absolutely the right time, I think, for all employers to take a step back and and really look and assess and evaluate, you know, analytically even what is working. What is not? Um, some of the things I th I found personally, you know, professionally very helpful is listening to the workforce, listening, surveying, focus groups, work environment assessments at different sites and locations to understand what is top of mind with the employees. What is a concern? You know, we we used to tee up a very simple question: if you were king or queen for a day and you had that magic wand. What would be one or two or maybe three things that you would like to change immediately? And then what are one or two things that you would like to keep? And, you know, everything is perfect. So let's just not mess with success and let it go. And one of the really cool things amongst many that we learned out of that is, in many ways, the benefits package that we were making available to our employees was highly valued. Mm -hmm. They were very appreciative of everything that was being brought to them. And the cost share was relatively lower. You know, when I think about employers today, they have an opportunity to leverage a healthcare and well-being benefits package that can serve as that hook to attract and retain top talent. And it's no secret. We've had a very difficult time these last few years from a workforce management. We're in a workforce crisis in many ways when we think about the healthcare sector, the logistics sector, 
um, it's, it's, it's been very difficult to find, I'd say the right talent for the right positions, you know, across mm-hmm. a myriad of different industry sectors, but the benefits package along with compensation, which is always important, you know, that really goes a long way when we think about some of those tracing back to those comments earlier on the data points. I think the, the value with an employer, if they look today and take a step back and see what's working, what's not, what's on the minds of their employees, what are those concerns? That's really where they can take action and really focus on really bringing forward solutions that are going to matter most to their employees. And instead of being potentially tone deaf, they're going to understand through their analytics what has delivered those outcomes clinically and economically with ROI that they expected. What's falling short? Where can they refine and iterate? And where can they look elsewhere that can really simplify that whole ecosystem as we as we know it? Yeah, so as I think about the benefits package and kind of starting down that path, it reminds me of, I was just cleaning out my closet the other day and there was this one expensive outfit from years ago. It's super cute. And I kept it with hopes that one day it will come out of retirement. It will make a showing, but quite honestly, it's never going to happen. That, that outfit just needs to be donated. It needs to be retired someplace else, but not in my closet. And it kind of reminds me, of what employers are doing today, I'm sure, because this is the whole process is complex, right? Which ones do I drop off? Which ones are like the outfit that I should just give away and not think about again or just discontinue? So do you have any insight on, you know, we have CHROs that are listening. We have directors of HR that are listening that that manage all the benefits uh, for their particular company. Where do they start? Let's say they do have five generations in the workforce. Um, In addition to listening, they go through their listening process. What step should they take next? Yeah. You know, when you look at the healthcare spend and trend over the years, it's been fairly consistent for most employers. We've seen year over year, the trend increase. Mm -hmm. The costs are just going higher and higher. When we peel back what's really going on along all the different vendor partners, I saw, you know, from my former employers, you know, which is pretty consistent with most employers, over 80% of the annual healthcare spend was attributed to two channels, medical and pharmacy. Mm -hmm. We've known for years, pharmacy is the highest utilized benefit by all employees, Mm -hmm. right? Every time they need to go get a prescription medication, whether it's mail order or at a, you know, local Mm -hmm. retail pharmacy, you know, that's, that's one claim. Anytime they need to maybe see a primary care doc or a specialist, you know, it's, it's another claim. So I, you know, as, as a benefits uh, strategist, I would focus initially on where, what are those big fish in a pond from a healthcare trend perspective and what can I do to tamp down the trend on spend year over year. So it can aspirationally get to a negative year over year trend on spend. And if I fall short, maybe it's flat at 0%. But how can I deliver better, better access, better providers, better solutions, better value, better quality, better data analytics, to really understand and deliver what means most to, you know, the workforce. But those are, those are two key areas. And and there's a lot to uncover when any employer has an opportunity um, to go through an annual market check or a RFP with, you know, medical or PBM or some other area. And also look at this whole ocean of opportunity on digital health solutions. Mm -hmm. How can those weave into you know our ecosystem from a benefit vendor supply chain to deliver you know even better access and affordability and guarantees on you know ROI return on investment and clinical outcomes? So if it's legit, it works. It's easy, you know, and it's proven. You know, I feel a lot more confident that we're going to execute well on you know all those different you know levers we can pull to try to best manage our, our healthcare spend. Um, you know, what's what's really difficult is we've seen in the past year just some pretty substantial increases 
on premium increases with health plan carriers and even medications that are new to market continue to seem like they're going through the roof. So my concern is, you know, anything we can do in a collaborative way to really bring that in check or, you know, maybe squeeze the balloon so that, you know, maybe there are some costs that are really difficult to manage, but there might be other ways to bring in solutions to tamp down that annual healthcare spend. There's a number of ways to get there. And um, I, I think it's just a matter of taking action and assessing back to what we were talking about earlier. What's working? What's not? What are those opportunities to do better? And I think we'd all agree we probably never met a perfect vendor. We've never met a perfect anything. But, you know, at, at the end, you know, that's how and why we refine and, you know, try to optimize what we're making available. And we can do that financially as well as clinically with a number of solutions, but the RFPs are, are part of that process to really understand what the market can offer at not just the best price, but the best clinical quality outcomes and accessibility and everything from a service level agreement that's so imperative to really ensure that, you know, we have a good construct. That's, that's key. Is there, you know, particularly with health benefits, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's such a huge expenditure every year. Um, for their employees and their families is are there any most common benefits that employers are putting on their wish list today that could improve the quality health and well-being of employees and their families proactively so we had talked before at the top of the hour about all these different apps you know that that employers sometimes offer um, but there's so many of them and it becomes overwhelming. I would think that the one of the things that an employer would want to do is to proactively help their employees and families be healthy instead of having to utilize health insurance benefits on the back end for things like diabetes or weight control um, or something that can maybe help you become a little bit healthier. Yeah. You know, I I would say that for far too long, we've been very reactive in how we utilize healthcare, right? And I think if we break healthcare into health and care, let's focus on the health up front. Let's focus on those preventive screenings that might just save our lives, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about annual physicals, colonoscopies, I mean, there, there's just mammograms. I mean, there's a there's a myriad of examples that, you know, I, I would question during the you know, a few years of the pandemic probably got pushed, you know, to the right, you know, maybe I'll get to it later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we think about how can we do our best to make sure that we can take care of ourselves and our families in a pre preventive and proactive, you know, approach, that's, that's really key. And really putting that emphasis and focus in our communications to drive awareness and engagement and utilization. I think that is a wise investment for any employer as well as, you know, their employees and their families to take full advantage of, you know, then you have the care side, right? And that's more of the reactive state where something's happened or something isn't right. And we need to address what's the symptom, what's the diagnosis, what's the optimal tr treatment pathway. So that that's a whole nother set of questions. And some of the things that I've learned over the years and seen firsthand is when you can leverage on the care side of the equation, especially for complex cases, and diagnosis could be in the cancer segment or musculoskeletal, for example, you know, absolutely take full advantage if you can uh, with an expert second opinion treatment decision support program mm -hmm. to ensure that you do indeed have the correct diagnosis and you do have the optimal treatment pathway forward. It's mind boggling to see based on the data that there is a number, a high percentage, roughly one in two that change or clarify that diagnosis to something a little bit different or clearer and a pretty high prevalence of, you know, what was originally a recommended treatment pathway that is modified to something that's more optimal. And that could include surgical procedures, medications. I mean, it could be a, a range of different things for that individual based on whatever it is they're experiencing. But that, that high rate that we've seen over the years is definitely worth the investment for any employer to also tap into when you get into the care side of the equation. So it works both both ways on both sides of the fence, but 
focusing more proactively and preventively, I think will absolutely be a wise investment long-term for the good uh, of the health of the population you're serving. So you work with a lot of top employers across the U.S. and I I suspect global organizations as well. Can you share with us a story of maybe how an organization started this process? They just kind of questioned whether their spend was the value that the employees actually wanted and maybe the process that you went through with them and maybe how aggregating all of their benefits or changing their benefits, um, how you actually help them work through that and what your solution was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I would point out one quick example, and this was more internal for the benefits team, but, you know, we, we hit a point where we saw an evolution in technology advancement on benefit data analytics. And mm. that was very powerful when we think about how do we identify not just the stated needs that we might have explicitly made to our vendor partners and what we're going to focus on for the next year, but what are those unstated needs? What are those you know, ticking time bombs that we have no line of sight into? How can we uncover that? Or how can we dive in you know, three, three clicks or three steps deeper into understanding what, what is a troubling trend or a bubbling trend that, you know, might, might be an opportunity for us to get ahead of in, instead of reacting to it after the fact. So we, we, we did a myriad of, I would say, analytical projects, um, much of which was on the pharmacy side to enable us to identify across, you know, the thousands of different medications what drugs are working, what's the range and cost of these drugs, um, and what, what is most optimal to make available to our workforce. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, we saw 20 to 40x range and cost of medications in the same clinical category when we looked at mm-hmm. brand drugs as well as generic alternatives for that category. And that really helped inform us proactively around optimizing our formulary, customizing our formulary to ensure that we're getting rid of the wasteful, you know, egregiously priced drugs that in some cases show, um, unfortunately, in real real world experience, once they're FDA approved, maybe little or no clinical value. But maybe, you know, they showed well during the phase one, two, three clinical trials when, you know, they obtain FDA approval or fast track approval. Mm -hmm. So how can we ferret out, you know, some of those examples as well as just, you know, some of the medications that were very high priced compared to alternatives that in some cases might have had better clinical results uh, for a fraction of the cost, pennies on a dollar. And how can we drive that savings, not just for the employer, but, you know, really for the employees, right? Like would every employee that was prescribed drug X and it costs $300 when they get to the retail pharmacy, get that prescription filled? I would, I would venture to say probably a large number would say, yeah, I can't afford it. It might cost too much. Or, Maybe they uh, have an alternative that's only three bucks and, you know, it's a 30 day fill. So, you know, how can we identify those examples? But, you know, that really played well into driving negative trend on our pharmacy spend year over year because we're Mm -hmm. very deep in analyzing, you know, the medications that should work, but are also, you know, valuable in regards to, you know, what they cost as far as high value, low cost versus high value or low cost, high, high, high value, low cost versus high, uh, low value, high cost. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really where you have this, this makeup of, you know, uh, you know, medications that, you know, can enable us to be better stewards of our pharmacy benefit and ensure that we're providing, you know, good, good options for employees to take full advantage of without breaking the bank mm-hmm. and uh, without mitigating you know, their healthcare either. Um, it doesn't do any good if you're not covering a medication that might be the only medication in that clinical category. So maybe for that reason, right. you do need to cover it. But if you have, you know, adequate gold standard alternatives available, that's really where, you know, there's some opportunities to really dive deep into making sure that, you know, we, we have the best value and, you know, a waste-free formulary as we would call it. Are there any trends that are occurring in benefits that employers need to look into or should look into in the next 
12 to 18 months that maybe are showing up on your radar that aren't as popular as health and prescription drug at this point, but could actually help proactively drive healthier lifestyles for their employees. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one one thing that's been fascinating in the last few months is all this social media and Hollywood, you know, buzz around Ozempic and these anti-obesity medications and GLP-1s. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, it's been fascinating watching these discussions and these roundtables because there are polarizing views Mm -hmm. based on what do you do? Do you cover it because it costs a lot or do you not cover it? And you view it as a lifestyle medication that you might have viewed back Mm -hmm. in the 1990s. So you have, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd say two different viewpoints on, you know, how to think and and manage something like that. Um, But, you know, I think the key takeaway is, there are opportunities and there are differences in opinion on how, you know, some of the employers and leaders wish to manage their benefits. And I think as, as a good partner, we listen and respond and in some cases proactively react or maybe, you know, or propose or, or reactively, you know, propose, you know, based on the feedback and input that they provide us with to uh, be there uh, for them, to help them you know, manage that very, you know, effectively. I think the the key thing is going back to, to, to the preventive side of the coin. If you can take a human centric approach, whether it's virtual or in person, uh, whether it's video, telephonic, asynchronous text chat from a multimodality standpoint and meet the people how and where they want to be met mm-hmm. in an uber simple way, no matter whether it's mental health, which continues to be a huge focus and area of opportunity Mm -hmm. in in America. Um, You know, the hypertension, obesity discussion with the, you know, GLP ones that I was talking about, a lot of opportunity there to figure out how do we make sure that we're intersecting, you know, a solution that's going going to be holistic and well-rounded to help, Mm -hmm. you know, those employers, really effectively manage that in a really good way so that they can achieve best in class outcomes clinically and, you know, certainly financially. Um, but it, it all goes back to prevention, I, I think. Um, and that's the thing that often gets overlooked. Everyone seems to want an easy button or a pill to swallow and, you know, everything goes away in a good way. And uh, mm-hmm. in reality, it, it doesn't always work out that way. So, you know, I think when you can offer up a robust, you know, fully integrated whole health solution that can take care of the cardiometabolic as well as the preventive and all in one also take care of the, the underlying, usually untreated, undiagnosed mental health needs that people have around anxiety, depression, that can take things a long, long way in a multiplier effect to help that individual, maybe for the first time in a long time, have hope and start to see progress. And, um, you know, I really, view it as two sides of the same coin. The physical and the mental are really all embedded and intertwined. So we really need to address that holistically and at the same time to really achieve the best outcomes for, you know, the people that are in need, whether it's singular or whether it's multiple, um, it varies greatly. Yeah. I I don't know if you remember reading this, but um, Google and maybe even Facebook um, at one point during, you know, as the news media was talking about all of these layoffs that were occurring. They were, both of those companies were getting criticized for their free lunches or providing a place for their employees to rest um, during the workday or even if they stayed late at night. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I used to work at an employer that did provide free lunch. And I had salmon and fresh vegetables every day. And we worked out as a team together. So they provided uh, workout trainers. It was an incredibly healthy lifestyle. And we all enjoyed our work so much. We worked out together. We worked together. We ate together. Um, And, you know, what are your thoughts on the criticism that Google and Facebook got for offering those types, what I would be considered preventative benefits? Yeah. And I had the privilege of, you know, collaborating with my counterparts at both of those companies and going to their headquarters and actually seeing all the good that they were delivering uh, Mm -hmm. to their workforce. And I'll tell you what, it was pretty impressive. Um, Mm -hmm. 
I was a big fan and still am a big fan for, I would say, their leadership, their thought leadership, their willingness to take shots in the aim to helping their employees have options and flexibility. And, you know, in, in the end, have, have the tools that could enable them to live and lead a healthy lifestyle. And, mm-hmm. you know, those are just a few tools in a toolbox that can certainly go a long way. Some might opine and say, hey, look, you know, that was a fad, you know, as far as mm-hmm. it's free lunches and, you know, there's yeah. definitely a cost to pay. But, um, you know, at the end, it's true. Um, every employer has their opportunity to take shots. I think, you know, it goes back to culture, too. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what type of culture are you looking to develop and enhance over time? And, you know, what we've seen from a healthcare standpoint, from a culture standpoint, is those organizations that really take care of their employees and have a very positive culture, very healthy lifestyle, as you mentioned, Berta, tend to do better financially, mm-hmm. economically, if you trace back their performance over the last 20 years against, you know, those that might not be in that same mix. And it's been mm-hmm. interesting collaborating with some other thought leaders on the innovator side about what they've done to really ascertain who are those high performing organizations that are really leading um, a focus on culture and healthcare mm-hmm. and well-being and really bringing that forward, you know, so you don't have to miss work for a half day to schedule an appointment to go see a doctor, but we're bringing the ease and convenience of maybe an on-site clinic that can provide a multitude of services to you right here at our headquarters. Um, whether it's primary care, physical therapy, vision exams, you know, dental, full mm-hmm. service dentistry, even it's amazing. Um, a lot of these services that are really made accessible, affordable, in many cases, free or for minimal cost share to the employees. So I applaud their efforts for taking, Mm -hmm. you know, those shots, but I think that there's also this virtual overlay that makes a ton of sense too, because not everybody's, you know, located at a, you know, headquarters location Mm -hmm. or a critical mass site that has, you know, thousands of employees. So, you know, how do we take care and address, you know, our, our people that are in zip codes that might be in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. that might not be anywhere nearby, you know, um, a medical facility. Um, So, you know, when we think about looking at the data and where people are at and how best to meet their needs, um, Mm -hmm. there's certainly some incentives and things we can offer up creatively to ensure that, you know, they, they're not left out too. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, one of the greatest benefits that we haven't talked about is the flexibility uh, that most employers are offering to their employees today. So that would harken back to most, some individuals are not going into the workplace five days a week anymore. Some are going in two days a week and, or some maybe not at all. And so virtual health benefits and proactive benefits, um, care benefits, as you've described, is imperative to implement within the benefits package, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's imperative. Um, When you look at what would compel someone to work for you or stay there working with you? We've seen also some recent studies that have, have shown that, you know, it's not just about the almighty dollar and compensation. That certainly is important right. and, you know, appreciated by many people. Don't get me wrong, yes. but, you know, it's, it's the healthcare benefits package. You know, what am I mm-hmm. going to have to pay? What am I covered? Can I see my same doctor who I have this long standing relationship with? Um, so, you know, really that, that hangs in the balance, um, on a, on a bunch of fronts, uh, not just from the medical and pharmacy side, but, you know, with all these other, you know, opportunities on digital health solutions and, you know, beyond, um, and just the ease of accessing those. And, uh, I, I think in the end, um, you know, having this harmonized support system is, is so key, you know, to, to help people, not just understand what, what's available to them, but really tap into it and lean in and, and use, you know, whatever might be helpful and beneficial for them or their families. So one of the things that you do um, is that you help companies bring together their benefits so that employees can easily utilize them. Is that a good way to describe it? 
It's a great way to describe it. And it really takes the complexity out. And, you know, when I was on the employer buy side, you know, what really resonated with me was I was having talks with a number of different counterparts in other companies, but, you know, we, we were turning on, you know, multiple solutions every year. And, and again, mm-hmm. over time, you scale it up and you might have 16, 20, 30 solutions now in this portfolio. Wow. And uh, it, it becomes very overwhelming and um, mm-hmm. confusing. So, you know, when you think about, you know, how can we simplify and really focus on that member experience? I, I would say in the last recent years, last five years or so, we've really seen a sharpened focus, heightened focus about it doesn't matter what you turn on or what you make available if no one uses it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can ensure that what we're turning on is truly adding value to the people that we're intending to utilize it, and Mm -hmm. they do utilize it, and they're happy with it because it's making their life a lot easier and simpler than what they had previously, we're doing something good. But we used to look at it in three E's, you know, AAA value-based framework, and it was all about the experience. That's member patient experience. How can we raise the bar, make that better tomorrow than where we're at today? That was foundational, right? And then secondly, what are those clinical quality effectiveness metrics? What are we going to measure to prove out that this thing is working or not from a clinical standpoint? And there's a series of different metrics that you could instill into that. And that drives the accountability from a clinical standpoint. And then the last one is the efficiency, the financial efficiency, the ROI. What's that economic value that we're ultimately realizing in terms of outcomes. So you have three key elements that all come together. But when you think about, you know, what Vita brings to the picture, Mm -hmm. it's, it's really aligned with all that from a member experience standpoint, because we're bringing everything together all in one from chronic condition management, cardiometabolic health syndrome, you know, including mental and physical preventive lifestyle all together. One place to go one uh, team that's dedicated to you with a hyper-personalized game plan. And, you know, they are on point to take care of you in a human-centric way. I love all this swirl and buzz in the media about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's all, that's all really interesting and important as far as how are things going to change in the future when we think about mm-hmm. HR in general, let alone benefits. So that we're in a fascinating moment in time about how do you harness this tech-enabled human-centric approach that Vita Mm -hmm. has fostered because we really think healthcare is, you know, personal and, you know, what better way than establishing a relationship with another person that can be part of your care team, just like we've had for decades from a primary care physician standpoint, but based on a range of, you know, chronic health conditions, mental health needs, Mm -hmm. and physical preventive lifestyle opportunities, you have a dedicated human-centric care team that's focused on you and really taking a deep dive to understand, you know, everything that's going on through motivational interviewing, day one baseline assessment, GAD7, PHQ, just to see if there's any anxiety or depression. And if so, Mm -hmm. we can align, you know, that individual with the mental health coach or licensed therapist. And, you know, that's been another troubling trend for the last number of years Mm -hmm. is lack of access affordability around mental health. So bringing that all together, really, really simplifies, you know, that employee and patient experience. And the beauty of it is they can do it like you and I are talking right now. Mm -hmm. We don't have to schedule an appointment and drive a half hour to go see someone. We can do it in the convenience of our home or wherever we're at, uh, whenever we wish, you know, any modality. And I think Mm -hmm. that's really key as far as how do we make healthcare work for you as opposed to you working around the, you know, the horn for the system and just trying to fit in where you can with scheduling and stuff like that. Well, I think it's, it's the trend of the future, uh, you know, with dislocated uh, workforces, with flexibility and, you know, quite honestly, with increased health uh, challenges that people are having, they absolutely need to access what you're offering, what the employer's offering and uh, Vita certainly pulls all of that together. So I think Vita is the future. Absolutely. All right. Are you ready for our rapid fire questions? So these are one questions, uh, one sentence questions that we ask at the end of every podcast so that our listeners get an opportunity to learn a little bit more about you. Perfect. Let's do it. All right, let's go. In the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Behavioral health habit has improved. 
Yeah, I, that's a good one. In, in my life, I think we've come a long way on uh, the, the behavior health, just, just the mental health focus in general, as far as really providing better access and solutions around that. And this last few years with the pandemic really served as a free pass for people to use telehealth for the first time. And what we've seen is people really appreciate how they can access something to help them on the behavioral health side, make their lives better um, around whatever stress, anxiety, depression they might be dealing with big time. What's your life mantra, quote, or saying that you live by? <laughs> you know, there, there was a, a great quote from JFK way back when, but it, it goes something like this. Um, and, and there's a few more, but, uh, if not me, who, if not now, when, so mm. if not me, who, right. And if not now, when, so mm -hmm. that's one. And, and another one that we, we would talk about internally in my past life is be bold, be brief and be gone. <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> if they like it, maybe we'll be back. <laughs> Very well said. Very well said. How has a failure or apparent failure set you up later for success? Yeah, uh, that's a great one. I think we learn a ton from our failures, right? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, too. if we're not failing, we're probably not moving the needle or taking shots uh, as well as we could or should. Um, but, I, you know, there, there, there's, there's one scenario where um, I, I think we could have pressure tested a solution way back when that just didn't live up to expectations, unfortunately. And, you know, we, we tried to refine and iterate over time uh, with the vendor partner, but, you know, in the end, um, you know, after a process, we, we had to go in a different direction. I think, I think that's just, you know, um, maybe a good example where everything isn't going to work perfectly <laughs> when you, yeah. you know, partner with any vendor partner. I mean, there's, there's sometimes some unforeseen surprises or things change and uh, we, we need to, you know, keep that in the back of our mind, but anything to mitigate risk in a really good way with a really mm -hmm. strong due diligence, that's, that's measure twice cut once is, is the old slogan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What tangible next steps can our listeners take back to their business today? to start reevaluating their benefits packages? Yeah. So there's a few things. One, um, they can certainly feel free to contact me anytime because I'll be an open book. I'm very transparent and happy to disclose and share, you know, what, what worked well from that vantage point. So that's, that's one. Number two, many employers are working with uh, consultants and brokers to some extent. And if they do have, mm -hmm. The privilege of working with a broker, benefit broker, or benefit consultant, um, I would really put them on point to help with the lift if they haven't done it before. Mm -hmm. To really, if not audit, analyze what's really going on. Um, the third thing I would say is there is a range of employers that may or may not have access to their claims data from their health plan carrier mm -hmm. or their PBM. So if they are in the seat where they do have access to their claims data and they do have a benefit data warehouse vendor partner, that could be a world of good to really independently validate what is working, what's the utilization, you know, and, and really learn from the analytics. If they don't have access to their claims data, nor do they maybe have a benefit data warehouse or a vendor partner that f provides that, that support. Um, there's, there's a real opportunity for them to, I would say, work with other colleagues and counterparts, um, that could show them the way, um, mm -hmm. if that's where they want to take things. But I, I really think transparency and data are key and foundational to really going after the opportunities out there. So hopefully that helps. Absolutely. Where can people go to learn more about you or Vita Health? Yeah, there's two places. Um, number one, they could go to LinkedIn, which is always easy. They could go to Vita.com for the Vita website. They could look me up on LinkedIn as well and direct message me anytime. Um, happy to connect and, and socialize around anything that might be of interest to them. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate this opportunity, Berta, to uh, you know share the story. Today, we have been joined by Jason Perot, Senior Vice President of Enterprise Growth and Partnerships at Vita Health. 
Jason, thank you again so much for joining me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much for watching. We would love it if you shared your thoughts on any of the topics we discussed in the comments below. And if you got value from the video, it would mean the world to us if you hit the like button and subscribe to the HR Morning channel. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Voices of HR.